Indian Feminist Judgment Project and we will start with a round table and we have dignitaries on stage, they don't need an introduction, we are going to skip that and this session is important because it sets the tone of our deliberations today as well as the work that we will be doing tomorrow, so we look forward to it. We will start with Professor uh, Kalpana Ganagaran and each, uh, each of them is going to speak for about half an hour and then the floor will be open for discussion. Good morning friends. Uh, and to begin with the uh, thank you to uh, uh, and the entire team for putting this uh, workshop together. It's working. It's working? Yeah. yeah okay. um, uh, basically, uh, what I thought I would do uh, today, uh, I had a semblance of a presentation, but my computer blocked me out uh, two days ago, and so I have kind of just made random notes uh, from memory. But uh, basically, what I uh, thought I uh, might do today is uh, to point specifically, and I'm, I'm following uh, roughly on the on some of the questions uh, the organizers raised uh, for this session, uh, namely how are feminism and law intertwined? Uh, how would uh, feminist legal methods reimagine the theory and practice of legal rules? Uh, how might feminists uh, demystify the indeterminacy of law? Um, and what sources might feminists use uh, in, other than uh, legal and casework uh, to dismantle law's empire and what can feminist legal methods contribute to reading and writing? Why is contribute to reading and uh, writing of judgments and can we develop new tools to write law beyond uh, the frames of asking the woman question, uh, feminist practical reasoning and consciousness raising. You can't hear still? Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, how does one open out uh, the relationship uh, between feminism and law and feminist legal methods uh, and law? What are the sources uh, one might use in uh, looking at or reimagining uh, the space of law? And I uh, thought I would uh, answer these, not, I mean, or address these rather, not answer them, uh, address them. Uh, something of a uh, roundabout fashion by uh, looking at the illustrations of the relationship uh, between feminist movements uh, and law. Uh, but even before I start, uh, you know, to say that, uh, I mean, to, to look at the last uh, point that the organizers raised uh, in terms of how do you develop new tools to read and write uh, and moving beyond the frames of asking the woman question, feminist practical reasoning and consciousness raising. Uh, to me, uh, you know, asking the woman question uh, is not uh, specific uh, to women or not specifically limited to women. 
uh, asking the woman question is a large project that is quite encompassing, so it's not kind of uh, restricted or limited to women alone. So also with uh, feminist practical reasoning and consciousness raising. So already with that last question, I would see that the space in which we are thinking through the relationship between feminism and law is quite uh, broad. Um, drawing on uh, some very recent uh, work that I've done uh, with uh, NCRB uh, and NHS uh, data, uh, primarily with uh, the NCRB uh, data and uh, legal reform uh, in the area of uh, uh, in the areas of rape and domestic violence. Uh, if you look at the late 70s and the, uh, the late 1970s and the early 1980s, uh, you can't but help uh, notice the inextricable connection between uh, feminist movements and law, particularly, um, but also between feminist movements. Uh, struggles for the civil liberties and the law. Uh, because this is the time, uh, for instance, between 1983 and 85, uh, when you have uh, a lot of debate on uh, custodial rape, not just custodial violence, but custodial rape. You have the uh, case of Ramiswati in Hyderabad and Matra in uh, Maharashtra at around the same time and uh, the reform in rape laws and the law commission reports that follow. But also on uh, domestic violence, which was not a human rights issue, it was an issue that was very specific to feminist organizing. And human rights came into consciousness of domestic violence as a human rights issue only much later. But in that period, uh, between 1979 or so and 1985, 86, you, the, the relationship between, uh, it, it's in fact feminist movements that make the law at that time. And the, uh, whether it was arguing on the content of what the law should be or interrogating uh, the law as it is or even suggesting possible uh, measures outside the frame of the law. Uh, but within the uh, realm of public policy that would actually um, uh, address the question of violence against women and, and, the, and the focus was on violence against women uh, you know, in, in that intersection of feminist, or the, or, or the intervention, feminist interventions in law. Um, you will find that uh, you know, the, the, the two issues that uh, seem to inaugurate that relationship in the, in the last phase that we know uh, are the two issues that have stayed with us even today. So even today we are talking about custodial violence, we are talking about rape and impunity, we are talking about um, sexual assault and rape by state actors, uh, and we are talking about domestic violence and debating whether or not marital rape can be considered violence. So marital rape today as we stand is an offense when a girl is a minor and is not an offense when a woman is a major, according to the Supreme Court. So we, in a sense, the issues of rape and uh, uh, domestic violence have stayed with us. But what interests me about that uh, early history is also that it brings uh, into being uh, a, a very different kind of a method. And I think that that, uh, that method has stayed with us also and has had an enduring quality to it, which is the method of fact-finding and presenting evidence before the court. So this was not, uh, you know, this was not evidence under the Evidence Act, not evidence that was presented formally in courts but evidence that was gathered outside of courts, but according to the formal requirements uh, of uh, the rules of evidence, and presented to courts in a way in which courts could not, in fact, ignore the realities 
of this violence and have to take cognizance of the realities and extend the scope of the law in order to meet the, uh, uh, the in order to meet the claims that were being made of it. And uh, to me, that uh, that that methodological uh, uh, you know advance, uh, if you like, of fact finding again, it's something that uh, you find within the civil liberties movement and within the women's movement coming together is a method that we have taken on board and developed subsequently in several other issues, whether of collective violence, whether of uh, violence against minorities, whether of human rights abuses or, uh, you know, uh, violence in areas where the AFSPA is uh, operating or in Chhattisgarh. The way in which fact-finding, in fact, brings, uh, uh, you know, uh, brings the truth before the court is something that was inaugurated in movement. So in looking at the relationship between feminism uh, and law, I also uh, want to, uh, you know, extend it to looking at the relationship between uh, movements, between social movements and the law, and how do social movements inform and educate those who are dealing with the law. And this in informing and educating of those who deal with the law includes the education of the legal fraternity and the judicial fraternity. And unfortunately, with the legal fraternity, we can say, well, it's not so much a fraternity anymore. But with the judicial, it is very much a fraternity. And we have the very few exceptions with us here today, Justice Ruma Pal and uh, Justice Prabhas Vidhev. And otherwise, it, it continues to be a, a very, very male uh, space within the judiciary. But movements have made an impact. And I think that the feminist movement uh, particularly has uh, made an impact and that is um, also through politics, yes, but through a politics that has inaugurated a methodological element into advocacy and legal reasoning, both. Um, and uh, you will see this uh, in several, several cases. I will cite two. Uh, the first is the case of uh, Rami Zabi, who was uh, raped in police custody and her uh, husband, uh, Ahmad Hussain, was killed in police custody in Hyderabad in 1978. And, uh, the, uh, and, and of course, uh, the police re refused to register an FIR uh, on the rape uh, and it required a large movement to push uh, the government to agree to constituting uh, a one-man commission of inquiry under Justice Muktadar. And if you look at the proceedings of the Muktadar Commission of Inquiry, what you will see is exactly this at work. That is that your, uh, uh, your human rights groups, your women's rights groups, your feminist groups very painstakingly put together a whole range of arguments on evidence and on what should not enter the consideration of the judiciary in deciding a case of rape. Because one of the uh, main arguments of the, uh, of the accused as well as those who were supporting the accused was that Ramiza was a uh, uh, quote unquote prostitute and she had a past sexual history and so you, you can't actually say that she was raped. And so within the Muktadar Commission of Enquiry, this was an issue that came up for a very lengthy consideration that past sexual history cannot enter into a consideration of whether or not a person has been raped. Uh, but that, that contestation of past sexual history actually comes most powerfully uh, through the medium of the movement. Uh, the second uh, you know, case that where again you have the, uh, that, that relationship between advocacy and, uh, uh, and, and uh, judicial reasoning and decision making. Uh, and of course, in, in order to have judicial reasoning and decision making, advocacy by itself is not enough. There has to be a judge there who has the sensitivity or the sensibility to take the reasoning on board and push it further through the medium of the law. And in a lot of cases, I think that that is what 
um, we are in fact lacking, that we might have a very robust fact-finding uh, report uh, which can completely, uh, which uh, judicial uh, uh, scrutiny can completely sidestep like we saw uh, in the case of Judge Loya. But if you look at uh, the, the relationship between uh, advocacy and uh, judicial reasoning, the, the case that in fact comes to mind is not, the, uh, not a case concerning women, but the case of Bhutan Sabah, and uh, Justice Pan is here, uh, where you had Mahashweta Devi and the entire uh, Kheria Sabah uh, Samiti, in fact, mobilizing uh, in order to uh, you know, push for the recognition of Bhutan Sabah's death as a custodial death. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Justice Paul ordered uh, the, a second post-mortem that was then videographed uh, and, and uh, gave a decision in, uh, uh, you know, compensating uh, the wife uh, for what was the custodial death. So I think that, that if, if one is talking about a methodological advance that has an immediate impact on the course of justice, we can in fact look further afield to look at the potential of that methodological advance. So if you're talking about fact finding, uh, what are the ways in which one can take fact finding forward? And that, uh, the, the roots of fact finding then are demonstrated to us through a whole range of, of movements. But feminist discourse and feminist mobilizing has a major role to play in, in uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, bringing that uh, on, uh, bringing that particular uh, method on the table. Uh, the second point that I uh, wanted to um, flag was that at no point when we are looking at uh, the relationship of women in law uh, or uh, feminist mobilizations around the law. Uh, at no point are we uh, talking about women uh, in a vacuum. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are specific social locations and very often, uh, unfortunately, we find that uh, the course of justice is often uh, defined by uh, or, or, or determined by uh, the location uh, of the uh, complainant. Uh, so do that uh, women uh, who have been subjected to sexual humiliation or sexual assault, uh, are they able to access uh, justice or access a fair trial uh, in the same manner uh, as women who don't belong to Dalit communities are, uh, and, and today are Muslim women able to access uh, or claim uh, uh, redress in, uh, on the same terms as women who belong to majority communities. And we find a number of cases where this has not been possible in a, inexplicably because this is never stated, that is an inarticulate premise and uh, you just find that you don't get the results from formal justice systems that you expect or anticipate. Uh, but of course, uh, the fact is that, uh, to use uh, Dr. Ambedkar's uh, description of graded inequality and uh, you know, uh, Uma's uh, reasoning on graded patriarchies, I mean, graded patriarchies always uh, definitionally are located in graded inequalities. And how does then the course of a universal justice, if you like, filter through graded inequalities and graded patriarchies? And I think that this is uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, core problems uh, that we encounter. I have also the specific case, on this question, the specific case of uh, Bhavri Devi. Uh, who was a campaigner against child marriage, uh, a Dalit woman, uh, gang raped by uh, you know, upper caste men, uh, does not get justice uh, for the uh, 
offence of sexual assault. But what then happens is that case travels through from sexual assault to sexual harassment and reaches the Supreme Court as the Vishakha judgment. And we actually have the Vishakha judgment on sexual harassment at the workplace, which is now accessible to the entire range of women at work, barring the Supreme, barring the courts and the parliament. Vishakha is applicable everywhere except in courts and parliament. But Bhavri herself does not succeed in winning a prosecution of the men who raped her. Uh, although under the Atrocities Act, it is clearly a caste atrocity. Yeah. Um, so the, the question of how uh, the courts of justice uh, meanders and then shifts tracks, the, the shifted track is also valuable. But I wonder often whether that shifted track uh, should be at the cost of uh, the, uh, the, the original complaint or the suffering, or whether that in fact compensates for or can compensate for the suffering uh, that she has already gone through, not only of sexual assault, but of a range of uh, violations attendant. On, on sexual assault for carrying out a program for the government yeah. uh, uh, against child marriage. Um, uh, I had, in fact, I'm not sure if I have time, but uh, I had uh, flagged a passage that I thought I would uh, uh, read out. I'll, I'll skip that for now. Uh, but where, uh, what happens with uh, Bhavi to me is also very interesting um, and, uh, you know, uh, shows us very different ways in which uh, we can uh, address uh, the question of sexual assault. Um, when legal uh, justice is unavailable to us, and uh, what happens with her is that after she loses the uh, case uh, in the trial court, she opts to return to her village and to continue to live there and to continue to work with women in her village. And she speaks of a point when, after her return when the village in fact uh, honors her and recognizes her as the Mukya Sadasi. And she says that as far as she is concerned, what is far more important to her at this point is to be able to return to that village and establish herself and uh, reinstate her dignity within that village as a citizen of that, uh, of that village and that community. And uh, in, in terms of an understanding of what might be restorative from the point of view of the victims. Uh, it is not a substitute for a fair criminal trial. But the fact is that I think uh, people also tend to think of law along multiple tracks. Not so much law, but of justice along multiple tracks. And <laughs> the reinstatement of personhood and integrity and dignity then we'll have to take place along several tracks at the same time. And uh, certainly what uh, feminism has taught me is to begin to see those multiple tracks and to understand the deep contradictions within, but also to understand what, what are the possible uses of those tracks without discounting them completely altogether. Um, the, uh, the, the connection also between uh, feminism uh, and movements uh, is uh, very evident and, and you know, was very evident to me when I read uh, Justice Banumati's judgment in the Premananda case, uh, which is, uh, you know, it was something that I actually did not imagine, uh, you know, that they would be a judgment uh, or, or a space in a trial court to go through uh, the, uh, the process that she went to contest first, to 
contest the legitimacy of Premananda as a god. You know, so the regurgitating of lingas and the uh, introduction of sacred ash from the hand. She had a magician perform those tricks in the courtroom and said that this doesn't really need spiritual powers to do it. But I think that that kind of uh, uh, destabilizing of uh, dominant norm in order to make space for people who have suffered uh, extreme violence and to uh, be able to carry that child forward was for me a very imaginative judicial strategy uh, which didn't necessarily violate any, any written text of law, but it, it just kind of took it, uh, gave it another spin that, uh, and that made the court an enabling space for, for the victims. Um, but also in uh, Premananda's uh, case as well, and uh, Justice Chandru can possibly enlighten us on this, uh, it was the Aidwa, uh, Maitri Shivraman, uh, by her, and a whole range of women's groups but spearheaded by the Aidwa and Tamil Nadu, that really pushed that case and stayed with it till it was decided in the trial court. So uh, there are two parts to this. One, how does feminist politics um, reimagine uh, uh, legal responsibility? So it's not, is it only the job of the prosecutors and the court of the, of the officers, of the designated officers of the court to gather evidence or is it our responsibility as citizens to be able to uh, gather evidence that is admissible? Second, uh, uh, in, in, in the course of that gathering of evidence and in the course of pushing cases uh, into courts, um, what does feminist solidarity and support count for? And how does it actually uh, enable uh, both officers of the court and complainants uh, and victims to, uh, to be able to hold their ground through the very, very arduous process that a trial is? Uh, so those uh, were uh, two, uh, you know, two major points uh, that I wanted to make. Um, and also in, in uh, you know, in, uh, sometime last week there was somebody who, a, a young person who wanted to do an interview on um, law and society. It was very broad, law and society. And when we were talking about the problems in uh, in, in the judgment, and I always believe that the problem is not with the ratio alone. You can get a perfectly good ratio, but if the auditor and the other comments completely undo the logic of the ratio, you trust it anyway. Although you have a ratio, it comes for nothing because, in the course of reaching that ratio, the judge has in fact thrown everything else overboard. And there are a number of cases, particularly pertaining to sexual assault, where you will see that. And this young man then said, uh, but you know, I mean, these, this lack of understanding or this kind of uh, bias or, or corruption or uh, indecision are attributes of the lower judiciary. I don't think that you would say that of the higher judiciary. And I was immediately reminded of a comment that Professor Bakshi made that first of all, lower and higher, higher are very false. Uh, descriptors, they are just judiciary in different jurisdictions. But if you look at the cases before us, whether it is the January press conference of the four judges of the Supreme Court or uh, any of the other cases before us, it, none of them concern the lower judiciary. All of them concern the higher judiciary. And we are all hotly debating Judge Loya's case, and Judge Loya belong to the lower judiciary. So I think that what we need to actually look at is not. Uh, again, uh, you know, situate uh, uh, the judiciary within a system of graded inequality. We all have its die hard. We are a caste bound, height bound society, and so we import the caste system of graded inequalities into every space that we inhabit. But I think that we would be doing great injustice if we, in fact, introduced a hierarchy 
uh, in our conceptualizing of the judiciary and judicial functions, because there would be no higher judiciary if there wasn't a lower judiciary. Um, uh, on, on, uh, on, on dismantling uh, law's empire, uh, I think we've already, as feminists, begun to dismantle uh, law's empire, gone, uh, 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 you know, covered a fair bit of ground uh, on, on that score. Uh, but the problem, uh, you know, continues to be how how do you uh, how do you understand the shifting tracks of feminist advocacy and its relationship with the shifts in law, legal regimes, judicial functionings, and the interference in judicial functioning? Because the one thing that is clear is that no. Uh, you know, no enlightened judgment can come absent a public or, or you know, a movement of consciousness on that question. And I would like to specifically cite the case of the right to privacy judgment. Yeah. What were the three dissents that the right to privacy judgment really stated? The first was A.V.M. Jabalpur. And A.V.M. Jabalpur came about only because of the civil liberties movement that was campaigning against disappearances, that was campaigning against encounter deaths, documenting encounter deaths, and additionally courts incessantly from the state to the center. Your, uh, the, the other set of issues that they talked about was 377. NAS Foundation came up only because of advocacy on LGBT issues. It would not have been possible for that judgment to come from the High Court of Delhi if there hadn't been an extremely strong mobilization on the ground. And uh, so absent that, uh, absent a political consciousness of rights and the relationship between uh, rights and mechanisms of redress is is reasonable, um, I mean, is it even possible to imagine uh, a, a progressive course of justice? Uh, what, are the, what, what are the lives relationships, for instance, between, uh, between uh, the, the citizen and the court? And uh, how, how does one keep that dynamism alive? Uh, without uh, allowing uh, courts to succumb to pressures of obscurantist politics. And that is always a challenge. So uh, the point is not only that there should be politics, but there is also the question of what politics and to what extent does, this, uh, does the framework of politics allow for dignity and non derogation of rights of the most vulnerable and marginalized uh, communities. And, <clears throat> and finally, uh, on, uh, on the question of the relationship between uh, different disciplinary spaces uh, and the law, if you look at the uh, Justice Burma Committee report, you will find that uh, there are a lot of writings that have been uh, cited of a lot of feminist uh, writers across the world. What I was actually disappointed with was that there was practically no uh, recall of uh, decades of struggle and feminist reasoning within the subcontinent that was culturally rooted, that had a history. You had Karabai Shinde writing, you have every uh, part of the country in every language. You do have texts, not many maybe, but you do have texts that recall questions of dignity, equality, uh, and particularly for women. And we need to be able to build a jurisprudence on a reading 
of historiography and history on the subcontinent as well. Thank you. And from the second, 
questions arise about how men and women are produced at all, thus opening up potentially multi-tender subjects of feminist politics. Can this, what I call razor's edge politics, be embodied in the law? I use the term razor's edge politics to refer to the way in which feminist politics must often maintain two contradictory positions simultaneously. For example, we want the recognition that rape is one end of a spectrum of sexual violence. Uh, along this spectrum ranges a wide variety of male behavior from what is in India called enduringly eat teasing to the marking of women as sexually available. We want the recognition that the pervasiveness of such a misogynist culture severely restricts women's access to public spaces. We want the recognition that not every woman has to be actually raped for her to learn to restrict her own movements. The belief that the threat of rape is everywhere, that it can happen at any time, and that it is the worst fate that can befall us is enough to make women police ourselves and restrict our own mobility. But on the other hand, feminists also want to demystify rape, to begin to see it not as a unique and life-destroying form of violation from which one can never recover, but as another kind of violence against persons, many of whom could be men. The fact that men too are raped is rarely acknowledged because of the dominant common sense that it's only women who are perpetually viable and in danger of rape. So the raises edge here is between seeing sexual violence as devastating and gender, which is also a feminist position, as well as seeing sexual violence, demystifying sexual violence as part of a larger repertoire of violence that includes, for example, being forced to eat feces, which as we know is a standard form of punishment of Dalits who believe they are humans. Let me take the second example now. I'm talking of uh, the way in which uh, feminist politics sustains simultaneously uh, uh, contradictory positions and therefore works a razor's edge. So the second uh, uh, example uh, uh, I would take up here is that of the idea of sex work as work versus prostitution as violence. Now, it's become very evident over the last few years in particular that the Bahujan feminists refuse to accept uh, sex work as an empowering category. They have refused to accept women from sex, <coughs> sex workers' unions as empowered and agential. And they argue that it is from marginalized castes and communities that women are forced into prostitution and that this demeaning work should not be valorized. This is publicly stated very often. So the, from this position, there are the Republican and unionized sex workers, but it is their understanding is seen to be a form of false consciousness. So here you have a feminist movement, but inside the feminist movement, so it's obviously not a feminist movement, there are feminisms as we all know, but on the question of sex work, two equally progressive positions, two, two positions coming from equally, in that sense, radical subject positions. This is not a standard, old-fashioned, conservative, 80s-style feminism which is saying prostitution is violence. This is a Dalit Bahujan position which is saying that it is women from our communities who are forced into prostitution. And so, valorizing it is to actually valorize an American patriarchy. Uh, and yet we know uh, that sex workers movements are also right. So, what I'm saying, this is what I mean by razor's edge politics. It's not easily readable which is the correct position in either of the cases that I mentioned. Now how would this complex razor's edge politics be reflected in the law? There's a distinct lack of identification between the multivalence of justice and the force of the law that must work towards eradicating uh, multiplicity. Um, nevertheless, it might be better to permit these multiplicities to destabilize the law than to attempt to enshrine anti-essentialist identities within the law. For instance, take Mark Allenter's work in which he attempts to build into the law a conception of identity as constituted in negotiation with several components in society. A recognition of this would require courts, he says, to adopt an empirical as opposed to a formal approach. The formal approach sees individuals as being part of only one group entitled to the group to the rights of that group alone. Thus, one who attains caste status loses tribal affiliation as far as the law is concerned. 
But the empirical approach, as he outlines it, accepts multiple affiliations and does not attempt to resolve the overlap between different identities, and addresses itself to the particular legislation involved and tries to determine which affiliation is acceptable in that context. This is Gallant. The problem, as I see it, is that this perspective can recognize identity as relative and shifting for those who access the courts, but not for the courts themselves and for those who constitute the courts. The latter, the people who constitute the courts are assumed to be outside the grid of affiliations and to be capable of selecting the appropriate perspective when necessary. In other words, is it really possible using an intersectionality perspective to recognize courts as embodying intersectionality themselves? Recent fem feminist rethinking on intersectionality demonstrates the impossibility of this project. Emily Graham, for instance, points out I quote her, within the disciplinary system of law, focusing on intersections between categories merely leads to the production of more categories, thereby supporting the law's propensity to classify, unquote. She argues that not only does intersectionality analysis in law fail to challenge categories, it actually deepens and extends the law's impetus towards the regulatory production of identity. Our political task then is to step away from seeking state from seeking state-led transformations and to enter into the more continuous everyday practice of hegemonizing common sense meanings around to contested notions so that our, which I will for the moment of course put into quotation marks because there are many hours inside the feminist uh, movements, so that our subversive understanding becomes the common sense. Now in many ways a transformation of common sense around sexual violence has happened over the last decade or so in a variety of ways, we can talk about that, but that, that transformation of common sense was evident around the huge uh, uh, mobilizations around uh, uh, 2012. Of course, we continue whether we like it or not to be situated in the terrain defined by the state and we are compelled to respond to the various ways in which our subjectivities and our life as citizens are defined by it. So I do not suggest that we abdicate, this, abdicate the state, for the state, of course, will not abdicate us. This is where the question of, in a sense, dirtying one's hands, dirtying one's clean theoretical hands with practice arises. What does it mean to actually dirty one hand, one's hands with practice? For example, a feminist lawyer for a rape complainant in India works alongside the state sanctioned prosecutor and does not fully control the arguments made by the latter, some of which may reflect patriarchal ideas about rape or ask for extreme punishment and so on. In addition, even if one disagrees with the quantum of minimum punishment set by law, surely a feminist lawyer working on a complaint of sexual violence will have to work to establish culpability regardless of the sentencing structure. These are not abstract questions, they arose in the specific context of the Faruqi rape case and disagreements among feminists on this was perhaps even greater than between feminists and patriarchal conceptions of rape. It is in the context of, new, uh, of, these, of the new legal developments in laws on sexual violence in 2013 that the terms carceral and governance feminism came to be used by some scholars for Indian feminism. The term castral feminism was used by a feminist critic, Manisha Sethi, in the context of the Faruqi judgment by the Delhi High Court that convicted him of rape in 2016. The judgment and its celebration by some feminists, according to Sethi, reflected carceral, feminist, carceral feminism and its unspoken alliance with the punitive state, unquote. Pratiksha Bakshi, an absent presence here, uh, she's not well, uh, Pratiksha Bakshi has been critical of the use of this term in the Indian context, pointing out that castral feminism is, I quote, Pratiksha, a specific critique by feminists critical of militarized models of international humanitarian law on human trafficking and neoliberal forms of control that bring migrant workers and borders into the prison industry complex, unquote. She questions whether it can simply be applied to an entirely different context, especially with reference to, let's say, she takes the example of special laws against caste-based violence. Would the framework of castral feminism be applied to these special laws that have come out of sustained campaigns by Dalit activists, she asks. But it is concerned that circulation of the concept of castral feminism in the aftermath of the Faruqi case mystifies the feminist critique of law's violence 
and feeds into anxieties that entrench the backlash against different strands of feminisms." Unquote. The term governance feminism, drawn from Janet Haley, is used by Prabha Kutishwaran for the 2013 movement in India. And she argues that the passage of the 2013 Amendment Act reflects, I quote her, the growing influence of Indian feminists in the corridors of power, a phenomenon that myself and others have tracked as governance feminism, that is Kotiswaran and others. Uh, Kotiswaran states that, I quote her, Indian feminism has entered a governance mode in the light of three parameters, namely an increased reliance on criminal law, a deep commitment to the highly gendered reading of sexual violence, and a diluted oppositional stance vis-a-vis -vis state power, unquote. She clarifies that she does not use the term pejoratively, that is governance feminism, and conceives that Indian feminism is highly skeptical of criminal law, unlike Western castle feminism. But nevertheless, Prabha suggests that increased criminalization could be one of the unintended consequences of the 2013 amendment. She explains that she uses the term governance feminism for Indian feminism as, I quote her, a conceptual tool to map a fundamental shift in the influence that feminists have vis-a-vis -vis the state. Where they were earlier an outsider social movement protesting against state policies, today they are a crucial part of the lawmaking process." Unquote. Now, governance feminism as, as it comes from Janet Gavali uh, is the term used for a universalist, top-down, state-centered feminism. And it terms as feminist universalism the idea that women are not a particular group of humanity but a universe of their own. And in this understanding, rape is not merely one of the tools in intergroup warfare, but part of a global war against women. This is Janet Hadley's critique of governance feminism. Now, from our location in the global south, we cannot help but recognize this feminism, this governance feminism, as Janet Hadley describes it, as an ally of the new world order and the new imperialism, which uses the language of women's rights to protect its strategic interests. Such feminist initiatives arise from international NGOs influential in the power structures of Western states, which have little or nothing to do with social movements on the ground, either in the countries where they are located or at the targets of their interventions. Given this understanding of what governance feminism constitutes, Kutiswaran's many caveats in fact make it clear that the use of the term for Indian feminism is forced. There are several problems with Kutiswaran's argument. First, she ignores a history of feminist critique of engagement with the law going back to the late 90s. The spate of laws on women's issues, as they were called in the 1980s, led to a sharp internal debate on whether such engagement should take place at all. Kotishwaran argues, as I quoted her, that fem Indian feminism has shifted from being an outsider social movement to re directly influencing state policies. Now, this is a historically untenable claim for the shift in the women's movement vis-a-vis -vis the state has, if anything, been the other way around. It is, very, it is well documented in feminist scholarship that in the decades immediately after Indian independence, many social movements, including the women's movement, had greater trust in the state, a trust that dissipated from the 70s onwards. The engagement with the state since then has been more and more mistrustful, but based on the understanding that feminists cannot afford to stay away from state processes. Second, Kotiswaran overestimates the influence that feminists, seen in isolation from other social movements in India, have on legislative processes. It is important to note that in Indian democracy, all social movements have sought to influence state policy and have had varying degrees of success. This must be understood as a larger aspect of Indian democracy and in terms of the ways in which democratic pressures are differentially successful in limiting the increasingly neoliberal, upper caste oriented, now increasingly Hindutvavadi and patriarchal character of the Indian state, depending on the composition of the government in power. For instance, under the Congress-led alliance of parties that included left party support, the UPA, that was in power for two terms until 2014, Significant legislation such as the National Rural Employment Guarantee, Right to Information and Right to Education Acts were passed under pressure from social movements. These developments were possible because the UPA, particularly in its first term, had emerged as a heterogeneous political space where social movements also had some voice. 
to assume from all this, to assume from this that social movements such as you know the one was Turkisan uh, Sangatan of uh, Aruna Roy or the uh, which brought about the RTI, which was a nationwide enormous grassroots campaign or the right to education and so on, to assume that these social movements had quote unquote entered the corridors of power is a very flat way of understanding politics. So it's not really correct to look at the women's movement in complete isolation from the larger picture of how democracy in India works and does not work. A third problem is that Kutisan counterposes what she calls a Marxist to what she calls a radical feminist tendency within Indian governance feminism. So they're both governance feminism still, but apparently there are radical feminist and Marxist tendencies. But it's not clear what these terms indicate. They are drawn from an earlier generation of global feminist scholarship, but I suggest that what we see in India at least since the 1980s late 1980s, is feminist analyses around issues, sex work, class discrimination, sex selective abortion, sexual violence, reservations, and so on, which are eclectic with regard to perspectives such as Marxism, liberalism, and radical feminism, which is own style women's studies 101. Um, I don't think that those terms are simply applicable in today's uh, uh, feminist politics in India. Moreover, there are very sharp debates within Marxist scholars, among Marxist scholars, on the question of rape. So, for instance, Kavita Krishnan, whom she does not cite in this paper, uh, for instance, Kavita Krishnan, a feminist activist and central committee member of a mass based Marxist Leninist party, as Marxist as they come, in a densely argued theoretical article, sharply criticized for their reductionism to other avowedly Marxist positions on sexual violence that emerged after the 2012 Gang Rape. One by Prabhat Patnaik was criticized by Krishnan for its historically reductionist argument that only pre-capitalist structures provide a base for patriarchy. And the other by, so in other words, uh, once uh, 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 capitalism and modernity actually take off, patriarchy would be under control. And two, uh, the other by Maya John for its class-based reductionist argument, exonerating working class male violence by setting up an unsustainable dichotomy that in rural India rape is by the powerful, while in urban India rape is by the powerless, thus failing to recognize gender power structures altogether. Cotisman unproblematically defines only John's argument as a Marxist feminist theory of rape. But Krishna's critique of John, which falls on the side of what Cotisman calls governance feminism, is Marxist feminism too. Like most Indian Marxist feminists, Kavita Krishnan is acutely aware that just as the defining factor at work in a particular situation may be caste or class, not gender, conversely, a Dalit activist or Marxist will have to recognize that the defining factor in some situation could be gender, not caste or class. Unlike governance feminism bereft of ties to movements on the ground and promoting the idea that there's a global war against women, the feminist movements and activists in the legal arena in India have historically been closely linked to social movements of different sorts. And it is a fundamental recognition in feminist discourse that rape is a political weapon in other conflicts, whether by the state against specific populations or by non-state actor, actors such as an anti-Dalit and anti-minority violence. This understanding is central to feminist views on sexual violence in Indian feminism. For example, Vibhuti Patel, writing after the gang rape of December 2012, expressed the prevalent understanding within Indian feminism when she emphasized once again the need to recognize that sexual violence is not only against individual women, but that, quote, patriarchal attitudes are reinforced by caste, communal, and class inequalities, and sexual violence is inflicted as a part of an assault by a dominant community, as in a caste attack or communal riot. Moreover, Cotisman seems to attribute all the developments in the rape law of 2013 to feminist interventions. But it is a basic recognition that when feminist views enter the sphere of legal reform, they are but one strand of many others that play out, including patriarchal and pro-status co-political interventions. Since the 90s at least, there have been intense debates within feminist politics on whether to engage with the law at all, how to engage with it, and what should be demanded of it. The fault lines lie between queer feminists of all genders, anti-child sexual abuse activists, sex workers' movements, particularly regarding the issue of trafficking, and more traditional women's movement politics. 
to flatten these very specific historical and contextual developments by use of universalizing terms developed in entirely different spatio-temporal locations is to fall into the framework in which theory developed in the West can be unproblematically applied to empirical reality of other parts of the globe. There, so there has to be another mode of rethinking feminist engagement with the law that will more accurately reflect what I have termed razor's edge politics that feminism exemplifies. Are there modes or forms other than the law that can enable us to practice a politics of justice that would reflect its fluid and context-driven character? What would it mean to consider seriously how post-structuralist and anarchist insights can shape our everyday feminist practice? Jeff Farrell, outlining anarchist criminology, argues that since reason and a sense of what is reasonable is largely constructed by the legal and cultural machinery of the modern nation state, progressive social change requires the unreasonable and the unthinkable. He cites Larry Tift, who along with other anarchist criminologists, argues for replacing state slash legal justice with what he calls fluid face-to-face -face justice grounded in emerging human needs. Now, the invocation of face-to-face -face community is, on the face of it, obviously, face-to-face -face on the face of it, obviously, a problem for feminists. So if you just take it at the level, at the most superficial level, feminist politics invariably turns to state and legal authority to protect the autonomy and dignity of women in the face of patriarchal and sexist power relations expressed precisely in face-to-face -face interaction. In addition, within multicultural societies, as most societies are today, does the sanction accorded to face-to-face -face communities close off the possibility of an outside to such communities, thus imprisoning women inside them. Right? So there is a problem if we understand face-to-face -face communities as communities that are, in a sense, given, uh, which are uh, what one would call as scriptive communities into which one is born and so on. But perhaps we we have actually in feminist practice shown that it is possible to redefine face-to-face -face communities as those that evolve their own regulations and rules. Let's say university, for example, as a face-to-face -face community. So, uh, so, so in other words, institutions that have come into being uh, in, in a space called modernity, let's say, that is not one into which you're born, or, 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 or a community that one chooses. So, a feminist practice of justice would and has redefined face-to-face -face communities as those that can evolve their own regulations and rules, for example, universities. It would, too, use political activism to ensure that such rules have social legal status and weight. And three, and this is where I think uh, the anarchist element would come in, a feminist practice of justice must be always ready to play off eclectically various systems of regulation against one another depending on the situation. Laws against rules, rules against laws, judicial orders against government, and so on. The experience of feminist activism around sexual harassment at the workplace in India illustrates what happens when rules evolved by face-to-face -face communities susceptible to democratic pressure are replaced by a law. The com committees in universities set up under Vishakha guidelines, which have run for in JU for over a decade, uh, it's one of the oldest years practices in the country. Uh, so committees in universities set up under Vishakha guidelines dealing with sexual harassment and gender sensitization, at least some of which have been functioning with a fair degree of success in naming the offense, raising awareness, and often ensuring punishment through procedures established by collective consultations have been disbanded on the grounds that law that, the law that came into force from 2013 now overrides them. Under this legislation, sexual harassment is still treated as a civil offence, but as many of the situations previously described as sexual harassment have now become forms of sexual violence under the 2013 amendment to the IPC, many acts of sexual harassment at the workplace, including universities, will also become criminal offences. In such a scenario, women and men, uh, uh, assuming there are male students who are being harassed as well, would be more reluctant to complain. If every complaint mandatorily involves the law, which it does now, it would essentially mean running the gauntlet of the all too familiar procedures of police, police investigation and courts. More significantly, the crucial legal distinction between a civil and criminal offence is that in the former, probability is enough to uphold the complaint while the latter requires proof beyond reasonable doubt. 
In cases of sexual harassment, the latter may be impossible to provide, as we know. The actual functioning of ICCs under this Act have come under severe feminist uh, internal complaint committees under this Act have come under severe feminist critique. And as a feminist lawyer, Monica Sakhani puts it, the new law restricts the rights of women, dilutes due process rights, and reduces the liability of employers. No country level legislation, even a feminist doctor alternative, can be sensitive to specificities of sexual harassment in different work contexts, from university to factory floor, from office to construction site. We have seen how difficult it is to spell out what sexual harassment is, even within a relatively homogeneous workspace like university. One overarching definition for all workplaces is bound to miss out on the slippery, ambiguous, and locally specific modes of sexual harassment. The possibility of justice is greater when small work-based communities hammer out acceptable norms of behavior and punishment that are appropriate to it. More importantly, such a self-constituting community is more likely to be active and to constitute itself anew constantly, thus resulting in suitable amendments to the policy from time to time. In short, from the lodging of a complaint to a successful completion, the democratic pressure exerted from outside, including writings in the public domain, protests and demonstrations, use of RTI, etc., at every stage. That is, the democratic pressures exerted from outside at every stage is constitutive of what I'm calling due process. Due process, in other words, exceeds the law. The problem with law is that unless it's very broad in scope, it permits innumerable loopholes, but if too broad, it can be either ineffective or typhonian, drawing into its ambit a number of ambiguous situations. So the idea of flexible justice systems can also address, I think, two dichotomies. One, the eternal sameness difference dichotomy that plagues legal identity, because while law is inflexible to this dialectic, the rules of face-to-face -face communities are more capable of responding to it. To the other dichotomy of women's agency versus feminism. Uh, and here I mean women's autonomy expressed vis-a-vis -vis normative feminism. So when women voluntarily take up uh, the way, uh, act in or enjoy pornography, or as expressed in the sex work versus uh, uh, prostitution as violence debates, or when they voluntarily abort female fetuses. So here's women's agency, but being expressed contrary to normative feminism. Accepting the idea of flexible justice systems and the social legal status of regulations evolving from face-to-face -face community interaction, premised on internal dissident voices and negotiations, would mean retreating from the representational politics of normative feminism. And that's an important uh, and self-critical agenda. In short, uh, following Ferrabend's against method, I'm advocating methodological anarchism as far as feminist engagement with the law is concerned.